do you have to outline a book before you write it? No, you really don't. And I know amazing writers who don't outline at all, but does it help a lot of us? <laughs> Absolutely. A lot of times in the writing community, you will hear the terms plotter and pantser. So plotter stands for somebody who completely outlines every single detail of their book, jots it down, plans it all out before they even write it. And then a pantser stands for somebody who doesn't plan a thing. But the truth is, I actually think most of us are not at either of those extremes and we're more somewhere along the spectrum between the two. So I feel like I fall almost right in the middle because I do like to outline, but I don't do a very heavy amount and I definitely don't go much past the 15 story beats before I just dive in and do what I have heard called discovery writing, which is a term I like a lot better than pantsing. So in this video, I'm going to show you my personal method that I've developed after many, many, many different books. I think I have seven fiction books published right now. I just finished writing the eighth and I'm about to start working on the ninth. So this book has been one of the absolute best things that's ever happened to my outlining process. And it really is pretty much in the same lines as the three act story structure. But I also really enjoyed how Abby Emmons laid out the three act story structure in her series here, which I will also link below. So I'll put both of these resources below because I am pulling a lot from both of them. And I highly recommend that you buy this book and check out Abby's playlist because I just think they're both amazing. So what I'm going to show you is basically a blend of this book, the three-act story structure, and then a few other random tips and tools that I've picked up along the way that have helped me. Originally, I really wanted to outline the third book in this series with you because I obviously published this one. I just finished writing book two and I need to outline book three in this series, which will soon have a name. A video about book titles is coming out soon with more on that. But I realized that if I try to show you my outlining process in real time, this video would be like an hour long. So I think I'm going to vlog that separately and kind of share the watch me outline version of this in a different video. But in this video, I want to actually be able to give you a complete outline so that you can see what it looks like. So instead, I'm going to use this book right here, The Secret Gift, which is the first book in the series, to actually show you how I brainstormed and outlined every single beat in this book. Okay, so a couple housekeeping things. Spoilers are ahead. <laughs> Obviously, I am going to share the full outline. So if you don't want to know what happens in this book, or maybe you want to read it first and then come back and watch this video, I would definitely recommend pausing before you go too much further because in about two or three minutes here, I'm about to start sharing the full breakdown of the outline of this book. And then secondly, this is my personal process. I just feel like I need to repeat that for the people in the back. This is not saying you have to outline this way because I think everybody is actually very different. And funny enough, I have been slightly different with every single book as I outline as well. So I feel like your process is most likely going to evolve quite a bit over time. I know mine has. So again, take the things that work for you, leave the rest. Don't feel like you have to do something if you're like, that doesn't make sense for me. That's totally fine. Okay, I actually made a PowerPoint and everything because this is so detailed. So let me take you to my computer and let's get started. And before we hit the outline itself, I do have just a couple tips. So the first one is that I like to use both a notebook and a computer document. The reason that I start with a notebook is because it removes that feeling that it needs to be perfect. And I personally have some struggles with perfectionism. So if I do this, it feels like it's okay to be messy. It's okay to write random questions to myself that I forget I even ask later. It's okay to write things that probably won't work just to get them out of my head. If you feel like you could type faster and it doesn't bother you to do it in a document, then that's awesome too. But I feel like for me, the document feels more formal and sometimes that puts this weird mental block in place. So that's why I start with a notebook. And then I go and I kind of re-outline in a Word document or a Google Doc. And that's when I start to add more to my outline and kind of solidify it. And often I do that multiple times because repeating the information can help me think of more things to add to it. My second tip is that brainstorming is quite literally all about asking the right questions. I used to get so frustrated. There would be questionnaires like, what's my character's favorite color? And honestly, it does not 
matter unless it's relevant to the story in a very important way. Like for example, maybe the character used to love the color red and then they watch somebody they love bleed out and now they absolutely can't stand it. Then it matters. And the same thing goes for these world building questionnaires that you'll see all the time. There's so many random questions like what do they do with their garbage? What do they do with the sewage system? And it's like if it doesn't affect the story, it doesn't matter. If it affects the story, then awesome. Like maybe they're going through the sewer system and we need to know what does it look like? How do they exactly do this? Is it gross or are they really clean? You know, then it matters. So to get the right questions, that's where Save the Cat Writes a Novel comes in, as well as Abby's playlist that I talked to you guys about with the three X story structure. But first, before we start asking those questions, it actually does help me to look at the big picture first. So that's my third and final tip before we dive in. And that's to start with the big picture things. The first one is the conflict. Yes, I know this often means plot, but in this case, it's actually still really character focused because it should be their internal conflict above all else. So it can line up with the external conflict, but it technically starts internal. To figure out what that conflict might be, think of it this way. They should have something they want more than anything else in the world, something they desire. And then they should have something that they are afraid of that's keeping them from getting what they want. And ultimately this fear is based in a lie. And so I think these three fundamentals, a desire, a fear, and a lie are all what is going to come together to create the perfect storm for your internal conflict. And so these do come from Save the Cat and the three X story structure, I think. They're just approached from different ways. They call it, I think Abby calls it the misbelief and Save the Cat calls it their flaws. I just really like the term their lie. And I can't remember, maybe Abby calls it that too, but that just really paints the perfect picture for me. It's a lie that they're telling themselves because we all do this. And so that's going to be very relatable to your readers and it's going to make them identify with this internal conflict. I put in the notes here that essentially your character is always going to have this issue with their view of the world that needs to be resolved and changed because when you boil that down, that's basically the definition of a character arc. So here are some questions to ask. Are you ready? What is my character's misbelief or lie or flaw? And just keep in mind, there are some really cool Enneagram things out there where they talk about different personalities do have very common lies that they tell themselves or misbeliefs or flaws. So if you want to, you can always go look that up. I'm actually going to link my critique partner, Brittany Wang's video about the Enneagram because she did this whole breakdown and I think it's super valuable for learning about different personalities that could help you think of something for this internal conflict. The second question is what caused them to believe this lie? So this is where their backstory is going to come in. You don't have to think of all of it. Again, remember what is relevant to the conflict. Then what do they think they want? And that could mean what do they think will make them happy versus what do they actually need? And then last but not least, how is their lie stopping them from going after it? All right, I'm going to give you the super basic version for the secret gift, but we are going to dig into this deeper when we get to the full outline. Jezebel, she wants people to know who she is completely, including her shape-shifting gift. That might seem awesome, but her father makes her afraid to show her gift because number one, how he reacts to her mother. But number two, on top of that, we see her mother telling her when she was really young, something that is going to become her theme in this book, which is that if people knew you are powerful, they're going to use you. This is her lie and it stops her from going after what she wants, which of course is for people to know her and her parents are the ones who caused her to believe it. Second, we have of our impossible choice. It's usually pretty early on in the story and there's a lot of choices in stories. The character goes along making choice after choice, but this one is more at the beginning. It's the thing that pushes your character out of their comfort zone, out of their normal life. And so it's usually based on their fear. And of course, as the name suggests, it is a choice. It's something that they need to choose. Even if it doesn't seem like they're choosing, they still are. Even doing nothing is technically choosing. So it is a choice. They should never actually be completely passive in this moment. So obviously you're going to first ask yourself, what is the impossible choice? AKA, what would it look like for this character to stay inside their comfort zone and never get what they want versus what would it look like if they took a risk, but they still tried to avoid their fear? Because remember, they're not going to learn their full character arc right from the start. That'd be way too easy and unrealistic. In The Secret Gift, Jezebel does not seem to have a choice at the first glance, but she could either A, agree with her father that all gifts are bad, especially her gift, and hide it from everyone, which is what she's currently doing, and therefore her current normal. Or B, she could be brave and show her true self to someone she wants to trust and see what happens. Well, probably 
probably still hiding the truth from her father because she is afraid of him specifically. The third big picture thing that I like to brainstorm is that midpoint, which is sometimes called the game changer or a plot twist, but obviously it's the middle of your book. It's the thing, like if you're having an arc, it's like right at the tip of the arc before they start to figure things out. It's almost always a plot twist and it almost always changes the game in a way that they just, they can't go back. It forces the character to make again, another decision. There's a lot of decisions in a book and this is one that will change everything for them. So the more active your character can be in this, the better. Let me back up because I want to be super clear. I don't mean to say like nothing can be out of their control because there's going to be a lot that's out of their control too. I just think that they need to be an active participant in their life. They can't just be sitting back and be like, oh, that's interesting. Someone did that to me. Well, that's not good. You know, <laughs> they need to be reacting and at least trying to take some control of their life. So the questions you're going to ask here are, what unexpected thing is going to upend my character's plans and maybe their entire life? Why does it matter? To them, aka how is it connected to their lie? And how does it change the game? For me, I thought Jezebel's gonna get caught using her gift because again, that's connected to her internal conflict. She didn't want anybody to catch her. Now, the midpoint plot twist, she got caught. And I thought, how much worse would it be if it was the boy that she likes who sees her using her gift? So at this point, she doesn't have control over whether or not she reveals her secret because that's way too late. But think of it this way, she still has control of how she reacts to it. And her world is flipped upside down. She has to decide what is she going to do about someone knowing her secret. And more importantly, she wants to see what they're going to do with her secret, whether or not her mother will be right, aka whether her lie will come true if people are going to want to use her. The fourth big picture thing is really figuring out their arc where they find the truth. In a normal story, the character should face their misbelief or their lie. And maybe they'll try not to face it, but eventually they always, always come back to it and they do face it. And this should lead to their lie or their misbelief being revealed that it is a lie so that they can then finally find their truth and therefore grow as a character and have the arc that we're all looking for. But of course I have to note that Jezebel's story is a villain origin story. And so instead of finding the truth, she is going to have something that validates her lie and makes her accept it as truth. The questions to ask here for a normal story are what makes my character recognize that their misbelief is a lie? Or if you did wanna write a negative character arc, what makes them embrace their lie? And then what dramatic action do they take to get what they want? So for Jezebel, when the boy not only does end up using her, like her mother said people would, he asks her to do shady things, we'll dig into that soon, with her shape-shifting gift, but then he also attacks her when she refuses, Jezebel realizes that she really does have to hide who she is to be safe and love. When he tries to force her hand, she chooses to frame him with her gift by shifting into his form when she is committing the crime he asked her to commit. When that doesn't work and he attacks her, she then shapeshifts him into a small creature, captures him, and leaves him behind in the human world on top of it. And then the last big picture thing we want to brainstorm is the end or your resolution. Probably the easiest you to figure out because everything you've been doing for their character arc is leading up to this moment. It's really just the details that you have to figure out usually. So the character is going to come around to fully embrace their truth and usually have a happily ever after. Ask yourself, what are the consequences of their actions, both the good actions and the bad? And where does this naturally lead them? All right, so in a negative character arc, I like what Abby Emmons called it, which was the tragic end. And this is where the character makes the wrong choice instead of the right choice, because of course they believe their lie instead of the truth and moves them on into an unhappily ever after. But keep in mind, even if your story isn't the typical happily ever after, maybe it's a thriller. I can't think of what genres don't always have happy endings, but sometimes they're a little bit more grim or a little bit more realistic, but that does not mean that you won't still have resolution. So resolution is where you see how their story is completed, how the character has come full arc and learned a lesson, even if it was a really hard lesson, and become somebody different than who they were when they first started out. So Jezebel's ending and resolution. Her wrong choice means she has to go back to hiding her gifts even more carefully than before. On top of that, she has hurt her friends and lost them. I'll go into that as well when we get to the full beat sheet, which leads her to having an unhappily ever after and needing 
looking to find a new home. Okay, now let's get into the full story beads. I'm so excited because these are, again, my personal blend of two of my favorite things in particular. The Save the Cat Writes a Novel book by Jessica Brody, linked below. Highly recommend that you buy it. And then also that three-act story structure by Abby Emmons, and I'll link her playlist below as well. Let's start with number one, the opening image slash the hook. I like both of these terms for different reasons. I think it's really important that you think of it as an image that you're opening up with, something we visually see happening so we can really feel connected to the story. But I also think the word hook is really helpful because you do want to hook readers in. You don't want to start at the point of day I've done this as well, where they're getting out of bed, life is boring, it's not relevant. You want to hook them in in an exciting place in the story and make them want to know more right away. So think show, don't tell. Sometimes in a story it is actually fine to tell, but not for this beat. We want to be showing the reader what's going on here. Questions you're going to ask yourself here are, is it visual and active? versus, again, a narrative in their head. Is it about the main character? And last but not least, does it have a hook that grabs the reader's attention? In other words, does it make the reader ask a question and want to know the answer? All right, to brainstorm a solid opening image though, I personally usually need to go to the second beat, which is the theme stated and brainstorm that first because that's gonna give me a really good understanding of my character and what I want my readers to see first. And that leads to the theme stated or the character's lie. This is the theme of the whole novel and it is that lie your character believes that you remember we just talked about. It could be about their world, about themselves, about someone else, but the point is that it's gonna make them make bad choices, which is going to be the whole point of this book. The word theme is not my favorite, even though it is pretty accurate for this. It just makes me think of nonfiction, so don't think of it that way where it would be like blatantly obvious. Think more like a buried theme, something that the readers feel like they know subconsciously and relate with, but they don't necessarily recognize it on the page, slapping them in the face. <laughs> so you might remember we brainstormed this earlier, but I do want to point out for this, this is again one of the hardest beats for me to brainstorm. And after a while, I stopped putting so much pressure on myself and I started realizing you can start out with a theme that you think fits your character. And then as you get to know them, it might adapt and shift and become more specific and accurate to your character. So that's actually what happened for me with The Secret Gift. I originally thought her theme was that she wanted to be loved for who she is, but I feel like it did shift. So it doesn't hurt to review the step and ask more questions. The first one, what is my character's misbelief, lie, or flaw? Whichever word kind of triggers it for you. Again, Save the Cat has some amazing examples in here. Love this book. It gives me so many ideas. And then of course you can also use the Enneagram types to get other ideas as well. What caused them to believe this? And and that's that tiny bit of backstory that's relevant that we already brainstormed. What do they think they want? What will make them happy versus what they actually need? Again, we already brainstormed this. How is their lie going to stop them from going after it? Jezebel's misbelief is that no one will love her if she reveals her true self. And like I said, that later morphed into something similar but different. And it's a more negative theme, maybe because it's a negative character arc, which is that if people truly know you, they will try to use you. Then what caused her to believe this? Well, when she was young, like we said, her mother told her this right before she left and never came back. And then her father confirmed it over and over and over again. What she thinks she wants is a mentor to train her and to get better at her gift, even if that means doing it in secret. What she actually needs is someone to accept her and who she is and not have to keep it a secret. That theme is still sort of a theme in the book. It's just the theme that the reader is going to recognize even though the character doesn't learn it. Does that make sense? Finally, her lie is that she has to hide who she is, specifically her shape-shifting ability to be loved and more specifically, to avoid being hurt. Therefore, she can't feel loved for who she truly is because she's too afraid to let anyone know who she truly is. So you can see how her fear or her lie is coming into play there and stopping her from getting what she wants. Uh oh. All right, we're going to continue on with the little one. So if you hear any noises from this little dude right here, that's because he'll be hanging out right here on the floor. Right, Boo Boo? Ready? Here we go. Let's just have an m and before we start, huh? So bad for you, but so good. Okay, now let's go back to our opening image or our hook that we talked about now that we've brainstormed the theme stated and we know more about our character and their internal conflict that is driving the story. Our goal here is going to be to find a way to show the reader right on the first page or first few pages what this conflict is. In The Secret Gift, we see Jezebel. She's at home with her father who is yelling at her to get him a drink. We 
see abusive behavior, how bad their relationship is through visuals, like him throwing an empty mug in her direction and demanding help. We then hear from him in dialogue what he thinks of her mother, which leads to a brief flashback of her mother and what her mother said to her as well, so that we can see it again. And finally, we see her hide away in her room and a glimpse of her friends as well, which hints at her secret of nature and what's to come. If you'd like to see this opening image in action, it is actually on Amazon. You can read the first few pages for free by clicking that little look inside tool. I'll give you a little hint here if you want to pause the video. The third beat is the setup. And you could have a lot of setup if you have like a really large story or you could have very little setup if it's a shorter story. It really just depends on the pacing. And this is things that lead up to that inciting incident, usually. I like how Save the Cat recommends showing a little bit of their home, a little bit of their work, and a little bit of their play to kind of give the reader a full picture. But essentially, we just need to see who they are before things get crazy. And this does not mean the boring things. It still needs to be exciting for the reader or they're not going to keep reading. But it can be mundane things if you can find a way to spice it up and show why it matters to the character. So for example, brushing their hair is going to be really mundane unless it shows something like their hair's falling out and it hints at something wrong with them that we're about to find out because it's hinting at a much deeper problem. Questions to ask are, have you shown them at home and work and play? Have you shown something in their life that clearly needs to be fixed, even if the character doesn't think that it does? Have you introduced other characters that will be relevant in the story? Are the things that you're choosing to show relevant to their theme and to their internal conflict? And what internal conflict are they experiencing based on their theme? Are their flaws clearly visible to the reader? In my setup, Jezebel slips out to see her friends and we see her shapeshift to be able to do this since that is a crucial part of the story. So we're also seeing how she interacts with them. That's the play side. We saw her at home and we sort of, I mean, she doesn't have work, but she is working on pretending not to be very gifted like them. So that's showing the reader a well-rounded picture of her life and her current approach to it. Now that we've seen her relationships with her father and her friends, we can see those issues and some hints at how the gifts in this world influence all of their lives in a really big way and how hard she's fighting to hide her own secret gift. Next is the fourth beat, which is the catalyst. And actually I merged this together. These are technically two beats. The catalyst and debate as they're called here or also referred to as the inciting incident and the impossible choice. I just see these two beats as one beat because to me it feels like it's this thing that happens to the character and then they react. It's all just one big conglomeration in my head. It's something external that happens to them that then makes them have to face an impossible choice and debate what they will do next, which is something internal. So your character has two options here. They can stay inside their comfort zone and they won't get what they want, or they could take a risk, but of course they're still trying to avoid their fear if they do that. Questions to ask. How does this change their world in a way where they can't go back? Does the catalyst happen to them? Is the internal choice up to them? Why does it matter to them? And how does it push them outside of their comfort zone? How does it make it impossible for them to go back to their regular life after this? And is this debate realistic? Save the Cat sometimes talks about the debate being obvious. And so instead, if it's like so obvious, it's like, why are they debating this? Then you can instead do, I think it's called a preparation beat or something like that instead, where they're clearly preparing for what's to come. So here is what we had originally. Jezebel doesn't seem to have much of a choice. She could either agree with her father, gifts are bad, and hide her own, what she's currently doing, or she could be brave and show herself to someone and try to trust them, basically. So now we're going to make it a lot more specific. In The Secret Gift, the catalyst or inciting incident is when Jezebel's friends actually discover a portal to the human world, and they decide that they should go sneak in. It happens to her because she didn't find it, but she was dragged along for the ride. The following debate or impossible choice moment is when Jezebel does not want to go through the portal with them. She wants to stay in her comfort zone. After all, this is just another chance to potentially be exposed, which as we know, she avoids at all costs. But then she figures, well, maybe I can practice my abilities in this world where no one else can see me. So it's almost like a safe space to her. And when she looks at it that way, say from anyone finding out about her gifts, she thinks that would allow her to get what she wants without taking any real risk of being found out. So she decides to go. The fifth beat is the break into two, which in a standard three act story structure, this would be the beginning of act 
too. So you can really see how similar these different outlining strategies all really are. Stories all boil down to a lot of the same things, you guys. So the goal here is to show just how different this world that they're about to enter is from the way things were in the beginning, the world we started out in. And when I say world, it could be they're going from one school to a different school, or it could be they're going from one job to not having a job. But in this fantasy world, it happens that I actually am literally going from the Ginny world to the human world. So that's a really obvious example of one world to the next. The questions to ask for this beat are, what internal conflicts are they experiencing after the inciting incident? or the catalyst. Again, Save the Cat talks about them entering this new world, literally or metaphorically. It really depends on your story, but you're going to ask yourself, are they leaving this old world behind? Are they stepping into a new world? And I also really like how Save the Cat explains why the Act 1 world and the Act 2 world should be really, really different. So that means you need to ask yourself, is the shift from this one world to the next very clear and obvious to the reader. Did your hero make the decision to take this step? Because again, we want it to be active versus passive. And is it clear to the reader why this is probably a bad move? <laughs> For Jezebel, like I said, they literally go into a different world. She and her friends have found this portal to the human world from Jin, and so they go through it, and then she convinces them that they should all split up so that she can then use her gift and practice in secret without anyone seeing her use it. This is obviously a bad idea, but she convinces herself it can work. To show how different it is from Jin, we're going to see them enter a human town and compare it to back home. And we're going to see differences with the people, with how they dress, with how they're acting. And so this break into two, obviously you're going to see the differences in the world throughout the whole act two section. So we're going to see more of this in the fun and games. I don't want to spoil it yet. The sixth beat is the B story, which I kind of think of this as also a subplot in a way. Save the Cat is the only one who talks about this. I don't find a parallel to this particular one in the three-act story structure, but Save the Cat talks about the B story being a specific character who throws a wrench in their plans because that can help me visualize a subplot a lot easier than just saying, throw in a subplot. <laughs> but if you want to think of it as a subplot to help you visualize it for brainstorming, that's fine too. The questions to ask here are, have you set up a B story character or subplot? Are their goals and intentions clearly their own? I'm talking about the B story character here. I don't think they should ever be <laughs> someone who's just in place for the sake of your main character to have someone to talk to? Can they in some way help your main character to learn their theme throughout the story? And just think of it this way, the B story character, again, they might arrive. <laughs> in the act two world, or again, they might change once they're in the act two world, which is what happens in my story and reveal themselves in their true character. So ask yourself, do they add to my character's internal conflict at this point? For Jezebel, I knew that I wanted a specific character to cause her trouble down the road. So I decided why not also make this character someone that she has a crush on. She likes this boy. It becomes even more important and even more heartbreaking later on if he isn't what she hopes he is. The seventh beat is the fun and game it's a really huge beat in Save the Cat, and they call it the promise of the premise. I feel overwhelmed by this one, so I really liked how Abby's 3x story structure video broke this down into three more manageable bite-sized pieces within this fun and games beat. The first plot point is where you ask, how is my character going to react to the inciting incident given their fear and their misbelief or their lie about the world. What decisions are they going to make now to avoid the most pain and also get what they want while they steer clear of the thing that they're afraid of? For the first pinch point, we're going to ask, what is the opposition, whether you're internal or external bad guys, that your character is going to have to face head on? And how can you show the reader that it's already looming in the distance? And last but not least, this pre midpoint reaction beat. So how is your character going to execute their plan? Plan to achieve their goal, remember, and also avoid their fear at the same time. And what is their step by step plan to make this happen? And I really like how Save the Cat mentions that they are either on an upward path, so it seems like everything's going well, or they're on a downward path where they're struggling. You could also ask yourself as you work through these smaller beats, does it show how much they're struggling or how much they're adjusting? In the secret gift, <laughs> The fun and games beat. I'm so glad you like this story. You like it? Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, <laughs> it 
is not fun for Jezebel, but it will be fun for the reader as we watch her try not to get caught in the human world. He's such a talker, oh my gosh. <laughs> so her first plot point then is her decision to separate from the group, which again, she already convinced them to do, and then she wants to practice her shifting. So we're gonna see her try a human animal, which is a stray dog that she sees in an alley, and she copies that. Then her first pinch point happens when she next attempts shifting into a small human that she runs into while she's in animal form. But his mother steps outside just as she becomes this little boy. So the mother accidentally scoops up Jezebel instead and brings her into the house, not even realizing it's not actually her son who was in the shadows. Finally, for the pre-midpoint reactionary hero, or reaction beat is what I kind of prefer to call it, she has to escape this home now that she's locked inside without revealing herself. So she's gonna take this obviously one step at a time because she's panicking. She doesn't have a step-by-step -step plan. She's just going to do one thing after another until she gets out of this house. So we're gonna see her shape shift into something tiny, hide, slip outside. From there, she's gonna start to struggle with her shape shifting because it's exhausting her energy. And so then she's gonna steal some food, rest for a bit before she finally heads back to meet up with her friends. Beat number eight is the game change changing midpoint or your plot twist, whatever you want to call it. In Save the Cat, I really like how it's described as two possibilities for your midpoint. It could be a false victory or a false defeat because those kind of trigger some cool thoughts in my head. This talks a lot more about that. Again, I'm just brushing the surface. I definitely recommend you buy the book, but I feel like no matter what, it should raise the stakes in the story as a whole because things just got that much more serious. Questions to ask for this beat are, what unexpected thing is going to happen to change all of this character's plans and potentially their entire life. Why does it matter so much to them? How is it relevant to what they want and to their lie? How is it going to affect them going forward? Is it either a false victory or a false defeat? And have you clearly raised the stakes of the story? Jezebel is feeling better after food and rest. She's returning to a state of confidence, thinking this time was successful. Actually, she's been pretty much on an upward path like we talked about all this time. Things have been going pretty well so far. In her happy state, she does just a small shift to confuse a nearby human, but unfortunately she is very careless about where she did this change. And the boy she likes sees her shapeshift and her secret is out. The ninth beat is the bad guys close in. And honestly, I like this beat as well, but it is just as huge as the fun and games beat. And so I really appreciate how the three act story structure actually breaks it down into three smaller beats again. First, let's talk about post midpoint. So this beat, your main character needs to figure out what their new plan is going to be based on that plot twist we just saw happen to them. And so the reader needs to know why is this midpoint false victory or false defeat so important to them? And how is it going to affect them going forward? Do they still think their plan can work or are they attempting to form a new plan and of course still avoid those big fears. How are they reacting? For the second pinch point B, we show the reader how the bad guys are not only closing in, whether they're literal or figurative bad guys, but they're getting super close and they're potentially about to cause some really big problems for your character. So some good questions for this beat would be, who are the bad guys? Are they internal or external or both? How does your character feel the pressure of them closing in? And how are they reacting to this pressure? And then for the supposed victory beat, this is where they think their plan has worked. They have this fleeting feeling that there might be some hope after all. Questions to ask for this beat are, what makes them think their plan worked? What happened to make them feel like they're about to succeed? And how does it seem like they might actually get what they originally wanted versus what they needed after all. And before I share Jezebel's story, I just want to point out in Save the Cat, I also really like how it mentions that this beat will be pretty much usually the opposite of the fun and games. So if they were struggling in the fun and games, now they're going to start to succeed or at least think they are. And if they're doing well and they were starting to have hope before, then now their confidence is going to be shaken and things are going to start going downhill, which is what's going to happen for Jezebel. So one extra question to ask yourself is, is this beat the opposite of my fun and games beat in the secret gift, the post midpoint reaction beat. Jezebel has to make a new plan now that the boy that she likes knows her secret. The reader clearly sees how threatened and anxious she is about it, but they also see her tiny spark of hope that maybe, just maybe, she can allow this one person to know. And more importantly, maybe he will prove her mother wrong and he won't want to use her, but will instead be someone she can trust who will love her for who she is and accept her instead. Then in the second 
pinch point beat. We see both internal and external bad guys closing in because first the boy tells her other friends and he reveals her secret without her permission. And then on top of that, the boy starts pushing her to use her gift, her shape-shifting gift, to steal something that he wants. So she begins to resist this feeling of being used and to trust him less now. So it's going downhill. There's this deadline for what he wants her to steal and she has to decide whether she's going to let him use her or or find a way to stand up to him while still keeping her secret. So this leads to the supposed victory beat. This is where Jezebel decides if the boy wants her to commit a crime, basically, she's going to shift into his form so that everyone thinks he is the one who committed it. Seems only fair to her. She then proceeds to not give him what he wants and hopes that by framing him, he will lose his credibility if he tries to tell her secret. And she hopes that he will leave her alone going forward. This would lead to her getting what she wanted in the beginning, which was to be known, but not used. Unfortunately, our hero's plans never work out, do they? So this is where the all is lost and the dark night of the soul come in. And these are also referred to as the disaster and the dark moment. I like to merge these two beats together because they feel like one continuous thing to me, just like the catalyst and debate do. And as you can tell by the names, save the cat version and the three X story structure version line up perfectly again right here. So I personally like the name disaster for the first beat because I feel like that really describes it well. And I like the name dark night of the soul for the second beat because that's just like perfect for envisioning what should be happening in these beats. So the disaster. This is the moment where all of their plans fail epically. Maybe they even backfire on the character and they make everything worse. Ask yourself, what is the worst possible thing that could happen right now? How could this disaster reveal to the character that they are actually to blame for what went wrong? Does the disaster happen to them? And does this feel like another catalyst moment that's going to force change? Then for the dark night of the soul, this again follows the disaster seamlessly because it's reacting to what just happened. So they're going to wallow miserably in the aftermath of what they've done and they're going to struggle to figure out what to do next. Questions to ask yourself for this beat are, is your main character reflecting on what is happening in this beat? Both what been done to them as well as what they have done. Is it leading them to their aha moment, which we'll touch on next? And does their life seem even worse than when the book started? Jezebel's disaster moment is when not only does the boy not take well to being framed and back off, but instead he actually comes to her door and attacks her. In a panic, she ends up shifting him into a small creature to protect herself and trapping him in a jar. When it comes to realizing that this is all her fault, we can see that this all started when she was careless and let him see her gift. She also made it worse by framing him and she definitely is to blame for him being a small creature now. Then the dark night of the soul reaction beat is where she holds up in her room, staring at the jar that holds this guy that she likes, her friend, and tries to figure out how on earth she's gonna come back from this. And she literally can't think of anything. The next beat is the break into three or the aha moment. And as the name break into three suggests, this is actually entering the third act in the three act story structure. But I really like the name, the aha aha moment because that again just describes exactly what you want to happen in this moment. It's when they're going to again come up with a plan that supposedly solves all their problems but this time hopefully it's going to be a plan where they're actually facing their fears and taking real action. Hopefully it's going to lead to them actually having some character development and finally learning their lesson that we've been here for all along, aka their character arc. Questions asked for this beat are how are they going to overcome that fear. Do they make a proactive decision to change their life? And more importantly, is it clear why it's the right change finally? How are they going to start to recognize their lie that they've been believing and actually seek out the truth? What lesson are they going to learn? And I have a note here that again, you don't want to bash the reader over the head with this lesson. It's something that should be more the reader relating to it subconsciously. Once again, I have to disclaimer here that Jezebel's story is a villain origin story. So the negative character arc is going to make our outline go off the rails just a little bit because even though she is breaking into three and she is having an aha moment, it's not going to lead to good growth where she discovers her truth. Instead, it's going to lead to her backsliding back into her lie and believing it even more than she did when we first started reading. So Jezebel's aha moment here as she's wallowing in her dark night is that as long as her friends know her secret, she cannot expect them not to tell someone to reveal it. She feels like she's not safe as long as they know and as long as they're around. So this revelation is going to guide 
all of her actions going forward. All right, that leads to the five point finale, which is my favorite beat in the Save the Cat beat sheet because it is just super, super detailed in here and helpful. And like I noted here, this is actually where I pretty much drop the three act story structure and just focus on what Save the Cat teaches because it's broken down into five smaller beats that are really helpful and really fun actually. So let's get into it. Gathering the team. You're gonna ask who or what is going to help your character enact their new plan. Then for storming the castle, how do they first attempt to take control of their life and fix the problem as they see it? Then we have the high tower surprise, which is another plot twist moment. What roadblocks are going to surprise your character and force them to reevaluate their plan? The fourth mini beat is the dig down deep. And that's finally where they're gonna truly look inward and recognize their lie. So you need to ask yourself, what is it? How do they recognize it? How do they react to this lie? And then last but not least, we have the new plan. This is where now that they've had these revelations, how does it shape their new plan of action? And it shows how they've truly grown and learned their lesson in this beat by showing how they do something that they'd never have considered doing before. Okay, like I said, this is my favorite beat, even in the negative character arc. But once again, we are derailing a little bit from the outline because Jezebel's not gonna learn the lesson that she should learn, that the reader knows that she should learn. Because if this was a happily ever after story, she should be learning that the right people do love you for who you are and they won't use you. But instead, she's going to cross this point of no return where she's gonna double down on her lie, fully accept it as the truth going forward. So that means she's gonna move into this five point finale, utterly convinced that she cannot trust anyone with her secret anymore. And that's going to influence quite a bit. Even if you don't do this five point finale, I think there are a few questions here that you should definitely ask yourself. Do they struggle with their plan in this finale beat? Because they definitely should. Is there a moment where they have to look inward and face their lie? Because that's gonna show the reader that they've truly learned their lesson. And if you have subplots going on beneath the main plot, do they all come together and get resolved here? Okay, so in The Secret Gift, here is how it breaks down. Number one, gathering the team. One by one, Jezebel is actually going to shift her friends into little creatures along with the boy she likes and capture all of them. Number two, for storming the castle, she then is going to reveal this portal to the human world to the authorities, which in this case is the Jinn royal family. And she's going to pretend her friends disappear appeared into the human world and just never came back. Number three, the high tower surprise. Unexpectedly, the royal family is actually concerned about this and they decide to send in the Ginny guard to go and look for these kids. So Jezebel's like, oh no, they're looking for them and they're not there. <laughs> so that leads to the dig down deep where she has to look inward and realize, again, her lie instead of her truth, that as long as anyone knows her secret, she is not safe. And that includes her father. More on that in a second. That leads to number five, the new plan. She convinces the royal family to let her help them so that she can be involved. And she visits the human world with the prince and spends time with him, which just a side note, that's in there, not necessarily because it has to be part of the five point finale, but more because I knew where Jezebel was going in the Stolen Kingdom series, being the evil queen, she needed to be leading up to that. So that's why I dropped that in there. And then her true goal is to actually abandon her shapeshifted friends and her father in the human world right before they close this portal. All right, this is the last beat because again, I merged a few beats. So the last one is the final image or another name for it could be the resolution. I think this beat is really, really important for readers to get a sense of closure about the story to really soak up the lessons that the characters learned. And it is essentially another reaction beat if we look at it that way. Also, again, Save the Cat talks about making this a mirror image to the opening image where you started to really emphasize besides just how far they've come. Some questions to ask for this beat are, are there any unanswered questions? that you might have brought up in the original story. And I have like a little subtext here that this does not include any new cliffhanger questions that are brought up intentionally at the end for the next book. This is more questions that you've been bringing up throughout the story that need to be resolved before the story ends. Is there any missing information? Is this another active and visual image versus again a narrative, just like that opening image? In other words, are you showing instead of telling? Will the reader feel like they've gotten a resolved ending? Not necessarily happy if it doesn't the genre, but resolved. Is the character clearly transformed from who they were at the beginning of the story? All right, in The Secret Gift, Jezebel has a 
officially found a way to remove anyone who knows her secret, answering the question throughout this book of will she be exposed? And we see this in a very active visual scene as the portal is being closed in front of her, sealing off the human world permanently, at least at this entrance. And we then also see her start to fall for the prince, which again is a hint at the next book. It's a little bit of a new cliffhanger question, what will happen between Jezebel and the prince? Oh, all right, that is the full outlining process. Now though, I want to really quick show you my original outline and you're going to laugh at how short this is because this is all I had to start out with. I don't want to give away too much more now that there's two more books in this series. So again, if you want to go and actually read it after hearing all that and see how that actually plays out in story form, I will obviously link this book below. That was a long video, so I'm going to end it there. Thank you for watching. I really hope it was helpful. Let me know if it was. It would mean a lot to me. I hope you have an awesome day and I'll talk to you again very soon. Bye!